All right, God is good, God is good, God is good. I will say an amen and singing along with that. That is such a good word, and that is so true, and it's so needed nowadays. Um, it, it's uh, the enemy's after it, you know. He's in, he's trying to put fear and anxiety and all of those things out there, and it's just a good thing to remember that God is good. That is a part of the greatness of God in our lives. Uh, last week, I started a short little series, not knowing, well, as a matter of fact, it, it, like most of my series, it, it has turned into something that's not a short little series. Um, it, it's really about a 10-part or 12-part or little series and out of the life of David, of King David. By the way, I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not, but David is the only David in the Bible. King David is the only David in the Bible. There are many of, many of, the, of our great Bible uh, leaders, uh, great folks in the Bible. Uh, there are multiple of them, them, you know, their names. But David is the only David. So when you say David, you're talking about King David, the greatest king that Israel ever had. And anyway, as I was reading about his life in preparation for the Hurt Locker series that we're in uh, live, and uh, I got really interested again for about the... 20th time or so in the life of David. And as I went back and began to read many of the events that happened in his life, I found a pattern there that I, I started last week trying to share with you about how to be great. And being great, I'm not talking about, you know, being wealthy or being extremely popular or um, any of the any of the things that the that the world considers greatness. When I talk about greatness with God, what I'm talking about is I'm talking about the fulfillment of your purpose, because God created you for a purpose. And I know that we all say that, and we all deep inside of us want to know what what is God's will. That's another word we use for it. What is God's will for our life? God created me for a purpose. What is my purpose? Well, when I talk about the battlefield, I'm talking about the field of, on which you accomplish your purpose. And, and God has a purpose for you. And one of the great passages that really talks to us about the fact that God knows us and that God has created us for a purpose is Psalm 139. And I want to read Psalm 139. I know it did last week, but I want to read it again because it's just such a, a dynamic you know, word for us. And, and, and here's what David said. David said in Psalm 139, for you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. Your eyes saw my, saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written. And you might say, what is they all or were written? Well, the next line says, the days. What was written in God's book, the, the days fashioned for me, when I, when you, as yet there were none of them. In other words, God, God planned the days for you. God looked down through eternity and saw a time where he needed you and he wove you in your mother's womb and he put in you uh, qualities and, and, and personality and uh, talent and, and giftings and God placed them in you so that you could accomplish great things for him and by great things, it, it, whatever that means, whatever he designed you for, whether it's a parent or whether you're the running a, a corporation or president of the United States or whatever it might be, God has created you for a purpose, and God has written all of that in His book before you even lived one of those days. And that's a really good, I think, encouraging word from the Lord because it tells me that God has his eye on me and that God created me for a purpose. Well, in, David's, in King David's life, you'll know that David was called a man after God's own heart. And, and because when you read David's life, many of the things that happen in David's life are so, uh, <laughs> well, could we say... Uh, 
um, he had several low points in his life. There were, there were several things that David did. David was a, a great sinner, actually, and, and yet he's still considered the greatest king of Israel, and by, God called him a man after his own heart. And why is that? Well, it's not because David lived a perfect life, and we know that. It was because David couldn't sin and forget about it, and it was because David, David's heart was turned to worship for the Lord. David was a, really the only worshiping king that Israel ever had, the greatest king and the, and the worshiping king. So last week I shared with you the first of 10 truths about how to be great or what makes great people, and it was this, and you'll, uh, hopefully you'll remember it, and that is every great man or woman becomes great on the battlefield. So we don't become great uh, sitting on the couch eating Cheetos. We, we don't become great um, withdrawing from the battle. We, we become great in the battle, uh, in, 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 the, in the purpose, in the mission, uh, doing what God has called us to do, doing what God has created us to do. That's where greatness comes into our life. And so for King David, it meant being a great king, and King David was a great king for about the first, uh, between 15 and 20 years of his, of his, of his uh, kingship in Israel. And did, there were, he fought many, many battles. He, he brought Israel through many enemies. And then one day, for whatever reason it might be, and I had three that I suggested to you last week, and I'll go over those very quickly. In, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, uh, for the first time in his life, the first time David did not go to battle with his army. In the springtime when, battles, when, when kings lead their armies into battle, here's the verses. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, and, but David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. And you know, because you know the story probably of David, that uh, that was Bathsheba, and you know that he called her to the palace. Um, committed adultery with her. She gets pregnant. Uh, he brings her husband Uriah home. Uriah's an honorable man and won't uh, go home and, and stay with his wife. And so David has Uriah killed in battle and takes Bathsheba as his wife. So this was a, a terrible low point in David's life. And um, and it makes you wonder why, <laughs> why he was called a man after God's own heart. But... Um, but you'll see as David, as David lives his life that there's, uh, there's a, God, has, God has a purpose. And listen, many of us uh, leave the battlefield at times, right? I mean, we, we, we aren't always faithful and true. We, we, we're tempted to move off of the battlefield onto the rooftop. And, and I'm just telling you that um, you don't become great because you leave the battlefield. You become great on the battlefield, but when you make mistakes on the battlefield, as all of us as human beings are prone to do, which is why we need a savior, that that's not the end of our life. And it's it, it, the fact that David left, the, the fact that David found Bathsheba on the rooftop was not uh, David's problem. The problem was David left the battlefield. And when he left the battlefield, it left him open for all of, the, uh, all of the temptation and all of the things that the enemy could throw at him. And so anyway, well, why did David leave the battlefield? Well, I gave you several things last week, and I'm just going to mention them because uh, I want to get back in the flow, and I want you to see this, this last great truth uh, about, about being great on the battlefield. All right, we looked last week, and these are just mere speculation. It doesn't tell us in the scripture exactly why David stayed at home, but uh, I gave you a few little, a few little uh, jaunts at it last week, and, and basically David stayed off the battlefield because he believed some lies. We have an enemy that lies to us. As a matter of fact, in John 8, Jesus said that, in him, that there's no truth in him and that he is the father of lies and that he cannot tell the truth because uh, lies just come out of his character. 
And so Satan lies to us and tries to keep us off the battlefield. And, and most likely David believes some of these lies. Like uh, the first one might have been, well, you've earned the right to retire. Now there's nothing wrong with retiring. And I know we have lots of retired folks in our church. And I'm not saying that y'all not, as you get older, prepare to retire off of your normal work and your normal job. And some of you have big uh, physical things and it's hard for you um, to do as we got older. And, and, and praise the Lord, I mean, all of us kind of look forward to maybe being able to retire one day, but I'm not talking about just retiring from a job. I'm talking about retiring from God. And I, I know that... I know that that shocks you that some people would do that, but yeah, some people feel like, well, I've, you know, I've lived my life and let the young people do it and so forth. So David might have just been infested with the attitude and believe the lie that he had the right to retire. Here's the second lie. You can't keep winning. Now, what this really deals with is the fact that, uh, that David had fought lots of battles and he wasn't getting any younger. And David had killed lots of giants, so to speak. So David had lots of giants' families that were looking for him. And if you went into a battle with the, the nation of Israel, of, and David was the king and he was in the battle, of course, you know, every soldier's intent was, let's kill David. If you want to be famous, uh, you, you know, you could be famous very quickly. All you'd have to do is just kill David. So David... Uh, David had a growing list of enemies and maybe he was beginning to lose a little bit of his nerve. Uh, of course, it had never mattered before because whether he was young or old, he seemed to trust God and no matter what kind of weapon he had in his hand or nothing in his hand. You remember he fought bears and lions as he was a little shepherd boy and he fought Goliath with a sling. And I mean, uh, it, was always, it was always his faith in God that brought him through. But, but maybe now the enemy lied to him and said, uh, you're not as young as you used to be and, and, and you've been very successful and you're old enough to retire and, uh, and, and you might die out there on the battlefield, so you need to retire. And maybe that was why David decided after 20 years uh, not to go to the battlefield. And here's the last one, and this is... Uh, the one that I really believe happened, if you if you just pinned me down and said, Pastor, what do you think happened? Well, it's this one that you this lie that you can that that you can hide premeditated sin, and by that I just simply mean um, uh, maybe David had seen Bathsheba on the rooftop before. Uh, his palace was right there and, and close to the home and they lived on the, the houses with flat roofs and, and sometimes women would go on the roof uh, and put uh, water basins where the sun could heat it up and then they'd come onto their roof. They might bathe on their roof uh, in the springtime or the summertime. And, you know, David most likely had seen that before and knew she would be coming out in the spring of the year. And so he, he, he just waited on her and he, and he felt like, you know, hey, uh, if, uh, if her husband goes to the battlefield and I'm here at home, there'll be an opportunity for me to fulfill the, what, what I'd like to do in life. Because the devil always promises you pleasure, which just is a good lesson, but what does he bring? He brings death, right? The Bible says in Romans, for, for the wages of sin is, what, death. Do not be deceived in Galatians, for God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap. So in other words, the, the, the devil is real good at promising pleasure and, and, and leaving us with pain in life. So David here swallows a lie and says, you know, I can do this and no one will know it. And he really tried to cover it up really well by bringing her husband home and all of that. And I, I know you're familiar with that story. But, but that's not the end of the story because, because David has a pastor and David's pastor is Nathan, Nathan the prophet. Well, God sends Nathan to David with a little report and, and it's like Nathan comes to David and says, I want to have a little conference with you, David. And uh, David said, oh, great, pastor, come on in. Well, Nathan didn't talk to him about church finances and, and, and about the, some committee he wanted to be on. Look, look, at what, look at what Nathan said to David. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and he said, there were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb which he, had bought, which he had bought and nourished and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate, it, it ate his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom and it was like a daughter to him. 
And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. Now, just one little point before I read the next passage. Uh, notice how quickly David is to how quick David is to judge somebody else for a lesser action than his own. I mean, here was a man with murder on his heart. Here was a man with adultery on his heart, and he's and he's judging a man about killing a lamb and stealing a lamb. And I mean, it, it's just it's just very easy to to uh, to to get out of whack when you're hiding sin in your life, right? Okay, so he's, he says the guy is going to surely die this, done this, and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Well, when, David, when Nathan said to him, you are the man, it pierced David's heart like an arrow. It, 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 David fell on his knees immediately and David began to cry and repent before God. And David said, God, don't kill me. He said, you know, you're gonna inherit the words of your prophecy and the words of your prophecy is that a man who has done such a thing ought to, ought to, ought to be killed and then his, his family pays four times as much back as the man stole. And David begins to weep before God and says, God, don't kill me. Uh, God, uh, be merciful on me. Uh, have pity on me. And, and so God agreed, okay, David, I'm not gonna kill you because I've created you for greatness and I've created you to be the king and the leader that you are. And so I'm not gonna kill you, but you're gonna pay these penalties, these fourfold penalties, and he did. And it happened with David's children, and we'll see that in subsequent times to come. I mean, the sword never left David's family from this point on. This began a very, very painful and tough period in the life of David. But, uh, but David did something that uh, made, him, made him great. It, it's, uh, it's one of the truths about being great. Because I mentioned to you before that we all make mistakes, right? Yeah, I wish we could say, well, not me. I, I, I've, uh, I've always been, been perfect. I've never made mistakes like this. And though you may not have ever murdered anybody and you may not have ever committed adultery and have all those kind of things on your record, but, but we, we make mistakes. And when we make mistakes, what happens in life? Well, when we make mistakes, what we do next is the important thing in life. And here's the second truth about greatness. Every great person takes responsibility for his or her mistakes and becomes greater through them. So if you're a great person, when you make a mistake, when you sin, when something happens that is contrary to what God has said to you or what contrary to his word, uh, what happens next is what determines failure or success in, in your walk with the Lord. And that is, once I make a mistake, what, what do I do with that mistake? Where do, I, where do I go with that mistake? Because taking responsibility for your own actions is what makes the difference between failure and success. You know, uh, as human beings, we've, we, we always have been tempted to pass the buck, right? You know, in Genesis chapter three, when Adam and Eve were created in the Garden of Eden and God said to Adam and Eve, uh, don't eat of that tree right there that's in the midst of the garden. Uh, it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and don't eat of the tree of life. And of course, Satan came in and spoke to Eve and said, boy, that tree looks good. And, and Adam and Eve partook of the fruit. And then, and then God comes into the garden and God's looking for Adam and Eve and because he comes down there every day and has fellowship with them. And, he, and, he's, and, he, and when he can't find them, he just uh, calls out for them and Adam answers him. And, and then God looks at him and says, what have you done? Have you eaten of that tree I told you not to, not to eat of? And Adam, did, Adam took it like a man. Adam pointed at his wife and said, she made me do it. And then he looked at Eve and, and he asked Eve, Eve, what have you done? 
And Eve said, the serpent has beguiled me. And then God looked at the serpent and he didn't have a leg to stand on, but anyway, uh, forgive me. But, but the point being, you see what happened. What happened is they, uh, uh, when, they, when they made a mistake, they, they sinned against God. The first inclination that they had when they were confronted with their sin was to pass the buck and to point the finger at somebody else. And I just wonder how many times we do that. I, I just wonder how many times we blame mom or dad or we blame our coworker, we blame our job, we blame our pastor, we blame our church, we blame anybody but ourselves uh, for that. Well, that's not gonna lead you to greatness. That's not gonna help you recover from this and, uh, and become a great person for the Lord. Well, after David's pastor visited him and confronted him with it, David writes a song, and the song that David writes becomes Psalm 51 in the Bible. God puts it at such a prominent place and allows us to see exactly what sin does in the life of, of a Christian and the life of somebody that's been appointed by God and sent by God and ordained by God and protected by God and loved by God. What, what do you do when you mess up in life? What does it cause in you when, 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 you, when, you, when you do things that, that are displeasing to God? Do, do you run and hide? Do you leave the battlefield? Do you blame somebody else? Do you, do you just quit? Well, David shows us in Psalm 51 how to, how to deal with sin in our life and how to get back on track as a great person and how to grow from that from that, from that view of life. I want you to notice the heading first of the, of the psalm. If you have a study Bible, it, most of the psalms have this type of heading. It's an instruction to the musician about the song, and it says, to the chief musician, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So uh, I don't know why the musician needed to know that. I don't know if they had a special tune for that, but, but anyway, this was one of David's psalms. There are 50, 150 psalms, by the way, and about 73, maybe even 75 of those 150 were written by David. And this is one of them. This is a great one. Notice what he says in verse one. David says, have mercy upon me, O God according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. What David was saying there by asking God to wash him and to cleanse him is David was saying, God, I feel dirty. I feel, sin makes me feel dirty, God. I mean, here was David. David was the king of Israel. David's slept on silken sheets. Dave, David bathed in marble baths. David lived in an, in an impeccable uh, palace. David wasn't crying out here that he was physically dirty and physically nasty. What David was saying, God, I, I, when I did this thing, it, 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 I feel dirty, I feel grimy, I, 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 feel, I feel like I need to be washed, and so God, if you'll wash me, then I, can be, then I can be clean again. And the reason he had to say that is because sin makes us feel dirty. No child of God can sin without feeling dirty. Now, a child of the devil can sin without feeling dirty, and I know that if you remember what your life was like before you got saved, you could do anything, right? You could say anything, you could go anywhere, you could do anything, and did you feel guilty about any of that? Did any of that bother you? Did you feel like, hey man, this is a big problem and I don't need to do this? And I... No, you didn't feel that way at all, but it was open the gate and let the wild horses run. But as a child of God, when you sin, no child of God can sin without feeling dirty. There's another truth that David uh, gave us, and it's in, it's in the second verse, I think. Yeah, there it is. In the second, in the second, no, let me give it to you, third verse. Uh, David says, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. David is saying, God, I can't forget about my sin. Now, a child, as I mentioned about the child of the devil not feeling dirty, a child of the devil can also sin and, and forget about it, right? <laughs> no child of God can, can sin and forget about it. You know why? Because we have a Holy Spirit that's living on the inside of us that brings it back up, that challenges us in life. 
Yeah, sin, it, it doesn't mean that we're always thinking about it. It means that sometimes, you know, we push that thought out of our conscience mind and it runs around the house and comes in the basement window where it shows up with more trouble than, than, than even in our conscious mind. It gets into our subconscious and, and, and it never goes away until it's cleansed and until it's dealt with. So David said, I, I feel dirty and I can't forget about my sin. And then he said in verse four, this is probably one of the, one of the, the, the greatest statements that he makes. He looks at it, he says, against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you might be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. David is looking at God and David, notice David is not crying out about the fact that he sinned against Bathsheba, even though he did. He's not crying out that he sinned against Uriah, even though he did. He's not crying out that he sinned against Israel, which, but, but he did. David is heartbroken here because David said, God, I sinned against you while you had your eyes on me. While you were watching me, God, I sinned against you. And my problem is, is, is that, Lord, I, you, you, you gave me everything. You blessed me. You protected me. You went into battles with me. You, you lifted me and exalted me. And yet, while, while, while you were watching me, I did this terrible thing in your sight. And so, sin had, sin had stung his conscience, hadn't it? Sin, sin, had, sin, had, sin had pricked him against, with his sin against, against God. Notice the next thing David cried out in verse five, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. That doesn't mean that Bathsheba was having an affair when she, or not Bathsheba, but when David's mom was having an affair when he was conceived. That's not talking about that. It, David's saying, um, when I was born, I was a sinner, which we all know that. Uh, that's the same thing, same thing true with us. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Look at verse eight. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Now you remember that David was a poet and David wrote many Psalms and he was very poetic in his writing. And David here is speaking as a poet. Have you ever used the phrase or heard the phrase, you are just squeezing the life out of me? You ever heard that? Well, that's what David says. David says, God, you are squeezing the life out of me. And here's a great truth that I think we need to remember about God and us, and that is that when we sin, God doesn't throw us away. See, the devil would try to convince you of that. The devil would say, God doesn't want you anymore. God, God gave you a chance and you blew it. Uh, he's not gonna want you around anymore. God can't do anything with you. Because you've, you've sinned you've, and, and, and you've rebelled against God and God can't do anything with you. But that's not the truth. Look at what David said. David said, you have broken, God, it just feels like you are breaking my bones. What was the issue here? Well, the issue was that God was, God, it, David's problem was not that God let him go. It was that God wouldn't let go. That God, God that, that the more David sinned and rebelled, it seemed the tighter God's grip got on David. And David looked at, David, David said to God, God, give it, let, let up a little bit, you're squeezing the life out of me. And so don't let the devil lie to you and tell you that when you miss it and when you have mistakes and failures in your life that God's gonna throw you away, David says, no, God, uh, I, 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 I'm, uh, you're holding on, but, but you're just kind of squeezing the life. Can you let up a little bit? In verse nine, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Now, in order for a right spirit in you to be renewed, you have to have a right spirit to start with. So David's saying here, I used to have a spirit that was right. I used to have a good attitude about things. I used to be a real believer. I, re I, I used to have some things going on in my spirit and in my heart that were good and, and, and now they're gone. What happened to me in all of this, 
stuff with Bathsheba and Uriah and all of these things is that that right spirit has left me. So God, I need for you to renew this right spirit and clean me and, and, and give me a, a good attitude again. Because I, I know because I've been in the ministry for 43 years or so, I have a little advantage on most people about, uh, about church and Christianity and blah, blah. And then I'm just going to say to you that in all of the, in all of my church life and all of my different churches and the places I've been throughout the years, I can just tell you this, that there's nothing on this earth meaner or nastier than a Christian out of fellowship with God than a Christian trying to cover their own sin and hide their own sin. Boy, you're talking about getting out of fellowship and you're talking about a mean, nasty spirit. Uh, that'll do. And David says, that's what's happened to me. And God, I need that. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm putting that before you and I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that this is what's happened to me in life. And then he goes on and says, don't cast me away from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me, which is a... Tremendous statement by David, but look at verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your generous spirit. David said, my joy, I, I don't have any joy in life anymore. The sin has robbed and taken joy out of my life. Do you remember as a child, maybe if you're old as, if you're old as I am and you were in church any time in your life, you heard a little chorus that, was, that sung, joy is the flag flown high from the castle of my heart when the king is in residence there. Yeah, that's a little song we sang as children. And, but that's the truth. When Jesus is the king of our life, the flag of joy flies in our life. And when we, when, when we make mistakes and we sin against God, what happens? That sin robs the joy out of our life and we no longer have the flag flying high from the castle of our heart and our joy is gone. And then one other thing, then, then will I teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praises. Uh, David is saying, God, if you'll cleanse me, if, if you'll wash me, if you'll, if, you'll, if you'll let that pressure off of me just a little bit, if, if, you'll, if you'll give me back my joy, if you'll, um, if you'll accept my, my, my uh, confession for sin, then I'll, I'll, I'll speak out again. Then I'll teach. Then I'll praise you out of my life sin shuts our mouth, right? Yeah, it, it does. It, it, it stops our testifying. It, it, uh, it creates a hypocritical situation in us, right? Yeah, it does. And so we don't praise, we don't witness, we don't talk. God said, David said, do this and then, then God I'll do. Now, all, the point of all that in Psalm 51, that's what David said when Nathan confronted him. David came before the Lord immediately and David repented. Now, David was a great sinner and there's no doubt about it. And this is not the first and only thing David did that was wrong and there are some glaring times in David's life. But David was not only a great sinner, David was a, was a great repenter. And this is what made David a man after God's own heart along with the fact that, that open praise and worship and respect for God were part of David's life. The only king of Israel where it was, as a matter of fact. And David loved God and David praised God and David believed and David had great trust in God. And when David sinned against God, when, when, he, when he started to fail at the purpose that God had created him in life, the first thing he did was immediately come back to God and seek God's forgiveness and repent before God and take responsibility for his own actions. Now there's one thing that God will never accept for sin and that's an alibi. In order to be a great person and become a great person, you must accept responsibility for your own failures and then allow the Holy Spirit to, to encourage you to grow through that. And David in Psalm 51 shows us how to repent before God. And he recovered from this. This event with Bathsheba happened when David was about, well, in, uh, in his mid-40s. David died between, when he was between 70 and 75 years old. 
So over about half of his life, roughly, was left when this happened. And David recovered, and David was a great king of Israel. And you can recover too, because we serve the same great God that took David and, and cleansed David and worked in David's life. David, David said this in the first verse that we read. He, he said, when he came to God, he said, God, have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. For a multitude of sin, there's a multitude of mercy. And God says, when you come to me, I know how you feel. And so when you come to me, just come telling everything. For we, we have not a high priest that can't be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So therefore we can come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So David said, God, according to your great mercy, cover my sin in life. And then, this, then the last thing that I want to leave with you is the way, the, way, the way you deal with not leaving the battlefield and not, and not having to come back and confess over and over and over these sins and these failures and all of these things in life is to get busy being a king. David's problem here was not what happened on the rooftop. David's problem here was the fact that he left the battlefield. Because if David had been on the battlefield, he wouldn't have been back at the palace on the rooftop. And I'm just saying this, that if we get busy doing what we ought to do, then we won't have time to do what we ought not do in life. And we won't have to come before God all the time with the confessions and all, because God's called us to be a king. God's anointed us, God, God has given us gifts, God has, has moved us, God has blessed us, God has saved us, God has changed us in order that our life can shine for him, that we can live in this crazy world and have an impact for the Lord and become that great person that God has designed us to be. Yes, all of us, we're all created for greatness. Not just King David, all of us are created for greatness. And we can become great as God leads us forward in life. So let's bow.